Welcome to the 2018 seasons of the Wealth Standard Podcast, celebrating life, liberty, and property. You are listening to Liberty Season 2. So, Leaf, welcome, uh, welcome to the podcast. It's uh, it's great, uh, great to have you on. Thank you, Patrick. I appreciate it. Glad to be here. Now, you're in a, a pretty, I would, I would assume, beautiful part of the world right now. Tell us, uh, tell us where you're living. Well, right now, I'm spending uh, the last month at my uh, development property in Panama on the western coast of uh, the Veraguas Peninsula. So, we're just finishing up our house and a couple of other houses and working on infrastructure. And so it, it is beautiful out here. It's great working at the beach. The, the tough part is the, uh, is the infrastructure. We have internet and electricity, but it's not always 100%. So leave. I mean, I, I really, I'm intrigued by your story. I'm intrigued by uh, what you do, where you've lived outside of the, the United States. Now, you don't have the, the stereotypical uh, Chicago accent. Okay, so I'm, <laughs> I'm assuming Spanish probably, you know, affected, affected that. Uh, but maybe get, kind of give us your your background and you know, you taking your family from from the United States and and deciding to uh, take your business uh, and also live live abroad. So well, it, it starts. I was born in Arizona, so there's there's gives my neutral accent, I think, um, <laughs> except with a few words that my wife makes fun of when I say them. But uh, I've, I've always been interested in working and living abroad. I went to Thunderbird for graduate school, so that's where I got started and went had my first job. Yeah, international business, yeah. My first job overseas. Um, and then came back and was living in Chicago and uh, met uh, Kathleen Petticord, my wife. And we moved, she was in Baltimore. We moved to Ireland for that first trip, working for a, a, a company. And then from Ireland to Paris and Paris to Panama. So we, when we moved to Panama, it was twofold. Um, one to, for her publishing business to get started and one because I have this real estate project here. Um, we bought the property about the same time as she launched her publishing uh, company. So we decided Panama is where we needed to be. Now, do you guys have, you guys have kids as well? Um, we do. Um, we have a daughter who was born in the States and moved to Ireland and we have a son who was born in, uh, born in Ireland. Very cool. So maybe tell us, you know, some of the, you know, I would say the, the, the debunking some of the horror stories, right? Because I, I would I would assume that, you know, most most individuals realize that you know the world is is kind of not blending together, but the the world is you know a lot easier to to travel than it than it once was, and right. living abroad has become you know popular. I would say especially among the older generation because living in the U.S. on you know either a fixed income or a limited amount of financial resources isn't going to, to go, go very far. So maybe walk us through from the time that you guys left uh, until now, like what have you seen as maybe some of the challenges and maybe some of how, how they're being uh, overcome just by the increase in popularity? Well, the, when we first moved overseas, the, I mean, the biggest uh, hurdle for me was paying my credit card bills. Um, the, you know, the internet wasn't around, online banking didn't exist. So by the time my credit card bill arrived in Ireland, uh, it was already past due. So I had to <laughs> that out. So technology over the last 20 years has made it much easier to live this kind of lifestyle. You know, I, I can pay my bills and do my banking. I mean, we have you know, properties in different countries, bank account in different countries. I can do all that online now. For the most part, there are a few things that some banks won't let me do still. But uh, if you organize yourself, it, it's much easier. Um, internet is available pretty much anywhere, if you're, especially if you're willing to pay for it. So out here on the coast of Panama, um, it's, you know, it's not a high speed connection and it's not super cheap, but it's affordable and it functions. So um, you can't, you can literally be uh, anywhere if you if you want to. So you probably, you and your wife probably get this quite, quite a bit, but I would say that the two, the two biggest hurdles and correct me if I'm wrong, but the two biggest hurdles to, to somebody actually entertaining living in, you know, Central America or Latin America or, or abroad, right? Num number one is, is safety. And I would say number two is, is language. So maybe address, maybe address those, those, uh, those two things before we move on. Sure. So yeah, safety is relative, right? I mean, we get readers who write in all the time to say, how dare you talk about 
and pick a country. Everybody has their place where they think is unsafe. Um, Mexico right now is getting a lot of attention. Colombia, when we first started talking about it um, about nine years ago, people were telling us we were crazy because Escobar was there. Well, he'd been dead almost 20 years or more than 20 years by that point. Um, and, and so right now, watching the U.S. news, I'm thinking, why is anybody living in the U.S.? Somebody gets shot every day. So it's, it's all relative. Um, so you have to get there yourself and, and, and check it out and, um, and, and see what you're comfortable with. Really, that's what it boils down to. The big question usually is from you know, older, you know, single women looking to retire. Um, they want to know if, it's safe, if a place is safe for women. And so if you're going to be on your own and walking around at night, that's probably a valid concern anywhere in the world. And so you want to be in, in a you know, highly secure place. But otherwise, you know, it's, these, they're, they're, things happen everywhere. And uh, they, you know, people talk about the high murder rate in Belize, for example. Well, that's Belizean gangs killing Belizean gang members for the most part. Um, and then a Canadian gets killed and they say, ah, no, look, a Canadian got killed. Right. He got killed by another Canadian. So what's safe is, is the question there. Language, of course, can help. Um, if you can speak the local language, you can you know, communicate better, you'll feel safer and you'll feel you know, more connected. Uh, and so it's one reason a lot of people pick Latin America, I think, is because you know, all the countries, except for a few, speak Spanish. And if you go to Brazil, in theory, Spanish is supposed to help you with Portuguese. I haven't found that to be true. Um, so I just, I just talk to them in English. It's easier. <laughs> we lived in France. I lived in France for four years um, straight. And the main uh, French that I learned was parler bon anglais. And that got me through you know, 90% of what I needed to because most people in Paris anyway um, spoke enough English to get me what I needed done. Now, leave, you know, and, and, that's, and that's helpful. And I, I would say that, you know, as I, as I mentioned, you know, I feel that the, the global community you know, is, well, it's becoming a, a community in, in, a, in a sense, right? We're all human beings. And you know, the silos and walls, in, in a sense, are, are breaking down because of technology, because of the internet, because of social, social media. Uh, and, and I think that people are, are intrigued by it, but when it really comes down to it, and I was mentioning this before we started recording, is there are a lot of constraints on those that have been working for the last 25, 30 years, saving for, you know, what, what we consider a mythical, you know, mythical retirement and, it, and expected to, you know, really stay put in the U S and be able to, to afford it. And so you're seeing, you know, I, I would say an intrigue, maybe not because of desire, but I would say partially out of necessity to figure out a way to live in a, a, a nice, beautiful climate um, and, and also have your savings and your retirement, your assets uh, be, stretched, be stretched further. So number one, you know, why don't you, would you mind addressing, uh, addressing that, that point? Okay, but, uh, but also maybe talk about the, the increase in those that you're seeing that have um, left the U.S. and are living abroad, uh, maybe not to retire, but, but essentially taking on you know, uh, a professional role as a consultant or a freelancer or being able to use the, the, uh, the internet to facilitate, uh, facilitate a, a business. Right. Yeah, there's a lot of moving parts to, to those topics. So to, to start with just the, the idea of moving overseas for retirement because it's cheaper, that can be true, but you got to choose the right place and you got to choose the lifestyle. So if, you've, if you're on the average Social Security check of $1,300 a month um, and some people are on less, you, there are some startup costs to moving overseas to get your residency. That's going to that's be a fixed cost. Um, your, your plane ticket for research and things like that. So you've got to have a little bit of money put aside. But once you get there, um, if you are happy to, to live a better life, but a more local life, you can live off of $1,000 or $1,300 uh, a month. Much depends on what you're willing to, to put up with, if you will. Um, so, you know, if you don't want to be in Chicago for the winters, which I can't imagine why anybody would after spending three years there, but then you move to Panama, but Panama is hot and humid. So you're going to want to run your air conditioner. If you're running your air conditioner 24 hours a day, you're going to have a high electric bill. So you've got to decide, do you run the air conditioner or not run the air conditioner? I run the air conditioner. I mean, that's it's not, not an option for me. Um, so you can, you can select places where you can decide how to live and live for better. So, for example, if you Medellin, Colombia, it's in the mountains. The high every day is 80 and the low every night is in the 60s. 
Um, you don't need air conditioning, you don't need heat. So there you go, your, your electric bill is nothing because you've got you to run your internet and your, your refrigerator. Um, if you buy imported goods, so here in Panama, is, it's a great example. In Panama City, we shop at the, at the expat uh, grocery store uh, where they have all of the imports from the US. Those cost more because they're imported. Um, I want my A1 sauce, as I like to say, so I pay $6 for a bottle of A1 sauce. Um, and that you, those are the choices you have to make. And then from a, just a pure cost of living comparison, you know, when we moved from Ireland to Paris, our cost of living went down, which people thought was crazy because we were living in a you know, small town in, in Waterford, Ireland. Um, and, but we didn't need a car in Paris. The apartment was smaller. My heating bill went down. And you know, if you compare the, a full budget to a full budget, our uh, cost of living went down. When we moved from Paris to Panama, my cost of living went down. But while I was living in Panama, my cost of living went up because I moved into a bigger apartment. I spent more money on air conditioning, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then we recently moved back to Paris. To, we're splitting our time between Panama and Paris. And I did another analysis and moving from Panama today back to Paris, again, my cost of living goes down. So it depends on what you're spending your money on. If you have a car, don't have a car, those kinds of things. Um, and so the other day, actually, we were talking about, you know, people move out to the middle of nowhere, Central America, thinking it's cheap. And it is cheap for the locals. If you want to live in a small house with no windows, no doors, no air conditioning, and not have a car and live off of whatever's locally sold for food, you can live on $500 or less a month. That's, that's easy. But if you want to have a car in a remote area, you're going to be replacing those tires every six months. You're going to have you know, car repairs, gas bills, and it ends up not being as cheap as you think because you want to live the way you want to live. So you know, deciding those factors in advance can certainly help you from running into a, a budget crisis. And then as far as people moving overseas, thinking about it, over the last 20 years since we've been living outside of the US, um, the average age that we see at our conferences, for example, has gone down. It's not just retirees anymore. As you said, it's, 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 you know, it's people our age looking to you know, have a better lifestyle today, but they still need to earn some money. And if they can do consulting or something on the internet, um, they, can, they can achieve that. So then the question is, where, where do you want to be? And that can be the dangerous question sometimes, because if you can be anywhere, then you've got a long list of places to select from. Yep. Yeah, that was, you know, this was, set, this was probably three or four, three, four years ago, uh, maybe longer. But there was a, there was a couple that was at uh, the, the CrossFit gym that I go to, and, and they were just in Utah ski, uh, skiing. And, but they had been, they had been uh, traveling, not traveling, but living around the world because he's a, a software developer and she, uh, she is a, a copywriter and all they need is a really good internet connection. And they've, they've lived in uh, Georgia. They've lived in um, uh, I think Lithuania. I mean, they just, yeah. they just like choose a place and they just, they just go. And, and, and again, it's not like they speak those languages, but I, again, going to, you know, our, our narrative where, you know, the world, you know, in a sense is kind of coming together and, you know, English is, is widely spoken and all you really need is an internet connection to do a lot of different jobs. It provides a lot of flexibility to people. Right. Yeah. That is, that is one thing also the, the, the younger generations in many countries are, are learning English faster. So, you know, in, when I first went to Croatia, I don't know, 15 years ago, 13 years ago, uh, I was amazed that most anybody under 25 spoke English and even some people over 40 spoke spoke some English. And so today, those 25 year olds are now, you know, 40. And so for anybody going today, there's just a, just a growing uh, pool of English speakers. So talk about, you know, maybe just address, address this a, a little bit. Um, if you've seen this, cause we had a, we had a guest on the podcast uh, a while back that talked about, you know, the uh, boomer reinvention, which is a second, a second career for, for those who had planned on, you know, retirement age 60 or age, age 65, uh, where they can, you know, start as soon as age 50 or age 55, where they can take their skills, take their experience and, you know, be able to, uh, be a consultant, be a freelancer, do work, work abroad. Uh, do you, do you see a, a lot of that in the, in the communities that you're associated with? Uh, and then also maybe address, 
you know, the fact that you, it could be a part-time thing, not necessarily living in the U S you know, hundred percent of the, or uh, living abroad a hundred percent of the time, but you know, splitting, splitting times, maybe address a couple of the, uh, address those points. Sure. So, right. We see more and more people. I mean, even, even the retirees, you move to another country, you retire. And I joke about it at our conferences, you know, there's only so much golf and fishing you can do. And the golfers may say, no, I'm going to golf every day, but eventually you got to find something else to do, or you end up sitting in the bar drinking and complaining because it's not like back home. So you do need something else to do. A lot of people do volunteering or they start, you know, turn a hobby that they used to have into a business locally. Um, we have uh, someone here actually out at Los Lotes that um, was a landscape architect in the States. They've retired out here to the coast of Panama and he's doing landscape architecture stuff for many of the people in this area um, just to keep himself busy. You know, he goes surfing in the morning and he, you know, works in the afternoon and it keeps him out of the bar. So that's uh, <laughs> the best kind of situation. He, he, he's, he's, having, he's having fun and staying active. And so more and more people are, are doing that. Um, some people need to do that, right? They don't have enough to retire today, but it, and it's easy enough to, to, if you can do things remotely, or if you have a special skill, you know, there are many places in the world where, you know, if, if years ago, uh, someone uh, went to Roatan, they were a pool builder. And at the time Roatan was booming and all the developers wanted them to move there and build pools for them. So if you, if you got that kind of skill and can fit, fit a niche, you can, you know, quote, retire or move overseas um, much earlier. And, uh, and again, keep your, your, uh, your time filled. And the, the part-time aspect to it, right, you can, you can snowbird. There's a lot of people who come to Panama, um, especially Canadians, they come down, you know, January, February, March, because it sucks up north and it's the best time of year to be in Panama since it's the dry season. And so you can do that kind of snowboarding um or not snowboarding um snowbirding sorry and uh others just bounce around so we have friends who don't have a, a permanent place to live and they move around from country to country where their budget allows them so if a currency goes super weak against the dollar they go spend time in that country because it's new and it's more affordable mm. um and can go back their main base is in thailand so which is always generally affordable uh, so they, they bounce around that way. Other people we've spoken with uh, over the years, you know, want to spend six months in the U.S. and then six months outside of the U.S., but change that destination every year uh, to have, you know, a new experience. Now, for us personally, our diet, our, our idea is to follow the seasons around the world. So the best months in Panama, which again are January through March, uh, the best months in Paris, um, and uh, the, the weather's always the same in Medellin. So the bad, where there's no good months somewhere else, we'll be in Medellin. In Colombia, yeah, yeah. So maybe go through some of the details as far as like how to how to do this, right? So what are what are some of you know if somebody goes from this like okay, I'm intrigued, I want to see if it works for me. Like what do you what do you look at as like the the first the first steps? And then we can maybe get a little bit more more complex into actually making this making something like this happen. Well, the, the first, I guess, is to go, are you doing this part-time? Are you moving around? Because if, you, if you're going to spend more than typically 90 days um, is the threshold on a tourist visa, spend more than 90 days in a country, you need to either get residency or do what's called the border run. And the border run has gotten a lot more complicated and, in fact, can get you into big trouble in many countries these days than it did 20 years ago. You know, 20, 20 years ago in Thailand, you know, to do the border run, it got so systematized that uh, runners would collect expats' passports, run to the border and get them stamped for them and bring them back. So they didn't even actually run to the border themselves. Uh, you can't really do that uh, these days in, in most countries uh, because you're, the, the, the border people are paying attention to the rules and there's different rules for different countries. So then do you need residency or not? And if you need residency, then can you qualify for residency? And so different countries have uh, what we would call pensionado uh, visas, so retiree visas. If you can show a certain amount of monthly income from a pension or social security, you qualify. And so then you hire an attorney and, and go through the residency process. If you're not on social security and don't have a pension, so it's these younger people that we're talking about, you know, the, under, the under 60s at least, um, there are rentista visas in some countries in Latin America. That's just basically you show you have X amount of income period. Those thresholds are higher than the, the retirement ones. And then there are investor visas. 
So if you invest in a country, um, say Colombia, for example, um, you can get uh, uh, a temporary renewable uh, residency visa in Colombia with an investing in, in a local company. Uh, so there's different, there are different ways to get the visas, uh, but uh, obviously the rentista or the pensionado is the easiest. And people think Europe must be complicated, but in fact, in Portugal, um, they have this self-sufficient uh, residency option, this per personal means or whatever you want to call it. And uh, the threshold is only about 1,200 euros per person. So if you have 1,200 euros of income, you can get residency in, in Portugal. Wow. No, I've been, yeah, but I, I was in Lisbon last, uh, last year. And it's, yeah, I think that what I, I was telling you before the, the interview that, you know, I, I grew up not really traveling anywhere other than like the Poconos or, you know, the, the outer banks of North Carolina. And it, so I didn't, I never went to another country growing up and, and, you know, I've been fortunate to, uh, to, to travel. And I, I, there's so many beautiful places uh, around, around the world that, I mean, most people just don't, don't have that experience, even though they have the means to have that, that experience. Right. Um, and so, but at the same time, you know, a lot of the beautiful countries, they, they still have, you know, restrictions, whether it's a visa or visitation and so, and so forth. So maybe walk us through, I mean, you're obviously in Panama, let's just use that as, as the example. Like what would someone have to do in Panama, right? If they're 60 years old, married, and want to kind of pursue a second, a second career, like what are the primary options there? So in, in, well, in Panama, it's interesting. So right now, Panama has an executive order that allows uh, people from 50 specific countries, the US and Canada being two of them, to get residency simply by being from those countries. So they still have the pensionado here in Panama, but this what we call the friendly nations visa. Um, you just, you have the right passport, you go through a few steps, which includes setting up a bank account and putting uh, $5,000 in there for a single and 7,000 for a couple, uh, and uh, have your attorney process the paperwork and you can have residency and under that Friendly Nations, it also entitles you automatically to a work permit. So that's great. Getting a work permit is one step. Getting a job, of course, is another. And there are more international companies uh, coming to Panama and looking for experienced uh, people, especially if you have IT skills. You know, Panama uh, needs more IT people, I think, uh, every day. So it's possible to find a job, but I think most people interested in this idea of going overseas and being overseas aren't necessarily interested in a job, but something that's more flexible. So in that case, you, you again, you, you can fill a niche, but with that work permit in Panama, that allows you to, to work for your own company as well without having any other uh, process or paperwork. So you can, if you want to have a, something local, you can set up a, uh, a local company and uh, you know, it's the difference between internet and bricks and mortar, what, which are you going to do? So for that 60 year old, the, my recommendation is the friendly nations visa and come on down and see where their skill set uh, fits if they want to uh, want to earn some money. Now, is there, if they go that route, is there a specific time frame they have to be there for? No, in the case of Panama, yeah, no, in the case of Panama, some countries do have that, and it's country by country. Um, but in, in the case of Panama, once you have your uh, permanent residency and the Friendly Nations uh, visa is permanent residency from the first approval, and we can get into details of temporary versus permanent and what needs to be renewed. But permanent residency, once you have that, you don't have to be in Panama ever again except to renew your card. So even though it's permanent, you have to renew that card. I forget. I'm trying to think. It's, maybe it's every uh, five or 10 years. If okay. you get a schedule, it's just a local ID. That's every 10 years. If you get a local driver's license here, that's a, unfortunately only every four years. Hmm. So talk, so talk about, I mean, I know that you have a development. It sounds like you're, you're, uh, uh, you're heading. Talk about, you know, maybe some of the investment opportunities that are, that are there that you've, you know, essentially seeing those that are moving to, you know, in this case, uh, Panama, that will, you know, essentially invest, uh, invest money. I know in some countries, there, there is a kind of a, a if you invest a certain amount of money, that uh, qualifies you for, you know, re residency. Uh, it doesn't right. sound like that's the case in, in Panama. But, you know, talk, talk about, you know, investment and in buying, buying real estate, for, for instance, and uh, the, complex, if, the complexity, if any, around it. 
So, right, we, we like to say you're not in Kansas anymore when you're buying property overseas. And again, country by country, there, there are differences, but there's some broad-based things to understand. First, uh, most countries don't have an MLS system. Most areas don't have an MLS system. So how do you find comps and prices and even find properties for sale? Um, you, you talk to every real estate agent you can find. So, you know, Panama in this, in this city, there's plenty of real estate agents out in the countryside. There's, there's few in, in most locations in my area. Um, they come, there's, there's no actual local real estate agents. There's some gringo agents that come and go. Um, but it's, so finding property out here is if, if it's not a development like ours, um, it's word of mouth uh, kind of thing. So that's where the language comes in, but in a, in a more, um, civilized place, if you will, like the city, uh, you, you can find real estate agents. So title, of course, is a big concern. There's no, uh, in some countries like Panama has a central registry, computerized registry for title, which is great. Nicaragua, for example, doesn't. So if you want to research a title in Nicaragua, you've got to go to the municipality where the property is located, wow. which means you are turning. Um, that's, the, that's the first thing buying property overseas, you want to do is, is find a good real estate attorney that's worked with other expats. And that's not the norm in the US. Usually the real estate agent does the contract and the, the, the title company does the transfer and you're done. Very systematized. Um, it is systematized outside of the US, but it's you, you need an attorney um, to review the contracts, to check the title. And we know people who have not used attorneys trying to save money you don't save money. That's the first rule of going overseas. Every time you think you're saving money, it's going to cost you somehow. So whether it's another trip or you pay too much for the property or it doesn't get transferred properly or it doesn't get transferred at all. We know people you know, bought properties in Nicaragua that have already been sold three or four times before they bought it. Um, and no title has ever been registered for those previous sales. So there are some hiccups like that. So again, that's why you use a, 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 an attorney. And people ask all the time, how do I know I'm getting the best price or the right price? And in Central American markets, it's, it's hard. Uh, again, ask a lot of questions and ask your attorney if they're doing lots of transactions, they should know what properties are going for um, in, in different areas. In Europe, it's a little bit easier, but still no multiple listing service. So when we moved to Ireland, for example, you know, I bought property in the States, but I never bought property outside of the States at that point and didn't realize that the multiple listing service was an anomaly. And so we went to a real estate agent in uh, Waterford and said, okay, we want to see this size and this type of property. And they said, okay, I've, we've got two. What do you mean you got two? We've got two. So we saw the two from that agent. Then you walk next door to the next agent and you see their three. Oh, that's interesting. Next door to agent. So it's more time consuming um, looking for property. And so this is one reason, I mean, it's one reason we do what we do. We have, you know, publishing services for, for real estate investors. Um, and we have at this point after 20 years, lots of contacts in, in many countries that bring us you know, new offers, new deals and things like that. But uh, research and, and, and visiting, you got to go take a look at where you're buying and what you're buying um, and, and don't do it while you're on vacation. Um, vacation is for vacation and real estate research is for real estate research. Well, this might be a good time to talk about, you know, what you, what you and your wife are doing as far as uh, a business is concerned, because uh, it sounds like you are, you're essentially offering uh, this type of information for those that uh, are, are interested in, in an opportunity like this. Right. So we, so we have, you know, I have my real estate development out here, but we, our, our main business is a publishing company called Live and Invest Overseas. And we have, you know, publications for people looking to retire, people looking to uh, invest in real estate. And also my other main topic is just offshore uh, information. So as we were talking about residencies, second citizenships, um, asset protection and structure. So we have publications for that as well. Uh, and then we tie it all together in, in conferences. So for our main countries that we talk about for retirement or living, uh, we, we do a conference every year and that's where we bring all of our, our local contacts together. So everybody can go in one session, you know, one sitting, I guess it's two, they're usually two and a half days. Um, and uh, from there, then they have a solid base to continue their research and decide if they even like the country. That's the first thing you gotta, you gotta, uh, 
go and visit and see if you like it. Somebody else could tell you it's the best place, place since sliced bread um, and you don't like it. And the reverse can be true. You know? So it's, it, it's, it's all uh, kind of personal, personal means. Okay, cool. All right. Thanks, Lee. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you for joining us as the Wealth Standard Podcast spends all of 2018 celebrating life, liberty, and property. Be sure to leave us a review on iTunes, and we'll see you on the next one.